and we're glad that you're here. But most of all, we're praising our Lord for the opportunity to witness baptism again today. What a uh, pleasure and honor it is, and it never gets old. As we just uh, listened to that song there by Alan Jackson, I guess you realize tomorrow is the 22nd anniversary of the 9-11 attacks. And this morning, we want to um, have just a small, short word, uh, moment of silence for those lives that were lost. It chokes me up each and every time that I think about it. I listened to it again last night. 2,977 lives were lost that day. Uh, many were doing just what they do, going in to save others. And uh, what an honorable profession that is and was and continues to be. So uh, let's not take that for granted. Let's rejoice, though, that we live in the greatest country ever, a free country, a country that honors our veterans and those that serve, a country that allows us the freedom to serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and a country that allows us to be where we are today, be in his house on a Sunday morning. So I'm going to ask if you would to stand with me as we start our service in a word of prayer. And thank you so much if you're visiting with us. We don't consider you a visitor. We consider you a guest. And uh, as we open this morning, we raise our hands to our Lord, knowing that he is the author and finisher of our faith. He is the reason that we're here. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. We thank you that we live in a free country. This morning, we think of all those who have come before us and served in our military and our armed forces, those that are serving today, Lord. We do not take them for granted. We thank you for the security that we feel. And we thank you for the freedom that we enjoy. But we know that it's not free. We know that even our spiritual lives are not free. We know that you sent your son to die on a cruel and rugged cross to take our place, that our sins could be nailed to that tree with him, that we wouldn't have to be. Lord, we rejoice this morning in the three baptisms, and we pray that right now that you would shower them with your blessings, that they would feel your spirit, because we know that Satan is always on the prowl and always on the attack. We pray that you would strengthen their resolve to serve you mightily. And we thank you that they are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, and they are proclaiming that this morning. Bless each and every heart that is here, Lord. Help us to let down anything that's troubling or bothering us, not be concerned about anything that's going on later this week, but find ourselves in a spirit of worship right now. We give our time unto you, Lord, and we ask you to bless it as only you can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> All right, this is Kendall. Kendall came up a couple of weeks ago and uh, said that a few years ago she had rededicated her life, but it just didn't stick. And she is rejoicing today that now it has stuck all over again. She has made a new commitment of her faith through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And she's proclaiming to you today that there's been a change in her heart, in her life, and in her mind. And she is excited each and every day to serve Christ as her Savior, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ, Kendall, and according to his uh, proclamation found in the Gospel of Matthew, I baptize you this morning, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise to Christ, grace to life for the last Praise the Lord. Prayers have been answered for Mitch. Lots of prayers going up, rejoicing with his family. And it's been such an honor and pleasure to watch him 
just be a changed man over these last few weeks. I told you a couple of weeks ago in the service when I presented him to you that uh, he was running along ahead of God a little bit too quick. I had to slow him back a little bit. And he's wondering what he can do next. And that's great, right? His enthusiasm is contagious to all of us. So this is a changed guy this morning. He said he thought he knew Christ as his Savior, but that all changed that one night during the revival. And let me tell you a short story. They came to revival that night because there was a storm, and he thought that church was a safer place than home. <laughs> Praise God, they were here. Uh, God changed his heart and his life, and I'm looking forward to serving him with you, Mitch. In accordance to your profession of faith, Mitch, of being a changed person and loving Christ as your Savior, in obedience to his command, I baptize you this morning, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Praise Christ, ready to life. Okay, Miss Jennifer, she walked the aisle years ago at Hickory Grove Baptist Church, but for some reason she never got baptized. And she said she'd been waiting for this moment for 50 years. 50 years. So this morning she's proclaiming to you that she's not ashamed of the gospel. She's happy to be here and share with you that there has been a change, but she's felt it more strongly each and every day here lately. And she said the thing that really set her off and put her over the edge is when she seen Mitch come to the altar that night during revival, she said, I want to be baptized when he is. Ain't that a great story? God bless you, Jennifer, and we thank you for being here. Upon your profession of faith, knowing that you love Christ as your Savior, and upon his provisions to, of baptism, we follow his lead. I baptize you this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Very all right, good to see you again. Before we get started, uh, let me clear up something. So Tuesday night, I'm going to be speaking in revival at Mountain Springs Baptist in Union County. That's down 601 South. And they have asked that our praise team and anyone that the choir could come and sing a couple of songs uh, before I speak. So uh, that's where it's at. Starts at 7 p.m. We'd love to have anybody come. And uh, sing along with us once again. That's Tuesday night at 7 at Mountain Springs Baptist. If you head down 601 South, you'll see the signs. You'll know exactly where to turn. You can't miss it. All right, if you have God's Word with you, if you would uh, turn with me, we're going to begin in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But before we get there, what a, what a great opportunity to rejoice this morning in baptism. And let me just tell you, I'm always nervous. I'm excited. I'm giddy. All those things that go along with it, but I'm nervous because you see, I am not worthy to baptize anyone. I'm no different than you. But you know, in God's word, John the Baptist felt like he was definitely not worthy to baptize Jesus. Matter of fact, he tried to get Jesus to change his mind, and he said, you baptize me instead. But Jesus proclaimed, no, in accordance to Scripture, this is what we need to do. Setting an example for us that has, that has spanned the length of time to where we are today, we're still observing baptism. And the Scripture says, you know, go into all ends of the world baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, I am not worthy of that for you guys today. But Christ was, and is, and always will be. So congratulations again to Kendall, to Mitch, and to Jennifer. And God bless you. Thank you. It's not always easy to get up before a group and 
proclaim that you love Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and that's what you have done. The scriptures found in Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. Meaning that believer's baptism is for everyone. It is a proclaiming of a change in your own heart, just announcing that to others. I told the three of them uh, this morning when we met back here in one of the Sunday school classes, I said, you know, baptism never saved anyone and never got anyone to heaven. The change happened long before you ever got to this point. But the tragedy of it would be, and we'll hit this again at the very end, the tragedy would be if you were baptized, though, and you didn't proclaim the gospel. You didn't tell anyone else about it. You didn't try to live a different life. You just went on with the same life that you were living before then. So our goal is this morning is to drive that home to each one of us. Many of us, let's just face it, at times we fall prey to living like the world all over again. That is the warning for today. The title of the message, Baptism, an Expression of Transformation Snatched from the Flames. I preached the message about snatched from the flames back during the COVID time, uh, and we had a baptism. Anybody remember that? I know one person back here, he got his hand up. You remember that? Did you watch it? It's kind of hard to have a baptism service. When it's just me and Nick and Caden, I think maybe the family came and sat kind of in the back and watched, but that was, a, that was an odd baptism service. But nonetheless, Caden had given his life to Christ. He wanted to announce it, and even though we had to do it over the airwaves of social media, we did it. Praise God. There wasn't no need to wait and, and do it later and put it off. No, we did it. Why? Why do you do that? Because you want to show that you love Christ as your Savior. And you want others to feel that. Now, I don't know if that, that particular message, that baptism had an impact on anybody that watched it, but I pray that it did. Because it was just as important that day as it was this day. Snatched from the flames, as it were. Taken from the context of God's Word. Taken from a life that may be leading to eternal damnation in hell, to accepting Christ as your Savior, to having a place not built with hands, reserved for you in heaven, and proclaiming that to every other person that you can. That is the goal. So we celebrate this believer's baptism as an outward expression of an inward change, an inward progression that doesn't mean that all our problems have gone away. It doesn't mean that we're, we're not going to sin. It doesn't mean that we're not going to have temptation. It doesn't mean that we're not going to question what God is doing. But what it does mean is that our lives have changed. And we want others to know it. Now, I don't want to embarrass you, but most of us, some form or fashion, we work in a work field that puts us in eye contact with people every single day. I want to just ask you this morning, do those people that know you best, that see you most, do they know that you have accepted Christ as your Savior? Do they? Do they know that you're Christians? If they don't, they need to. They should. They should see it with the way that you act, behave, the things that you say things that you do or don't do. You see, you're telling it or preaching it every single moment of every day. Let's look at this scripture here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18. You've been sitting a while, I'm going to ask you to stand. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 16. Here's what the Word says. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. How differently 
we know him now, right? Right, you three? How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life has gone, a new life has begun, and all of this is a gift from God. A gift from God, a free gift. We can't buy it, we can't earn it, we can't do it, enough right things to get it. A gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. You may be seated. May God add his blessings to our reading. You know, a transformation, that's a big word, but basically it means a change or a conversion in a person's behavior. There should be a time in our lives that we've accepted Christ that there was a change, there was a conversion, there was a transformation. There was a 180 degree turn from doing the things that you should do to not doing what Christ wants us to do. Have you experienced that? I'm not asking you, do, the, do you know the exact date? That, that would be great. But what I'm asking you, is there a point in time that you remember asking Christ into your heart and making a change? You need to search your heart and you need to find that moment. And you need to make sure that you have that moment. If you don't, you need to have it. And today would be a good day for it. You know, Jesus doesn't just come into our lives to save us from our past. We can't do much about our past. But he purifies us to be a part of his own special group of people. And you say, well, Pastor, I don't, most days I don't feel very special. Just listen to me a minute. A part of his special group of people eager to do what's right. Are you eager to do what's right? Are you eager to live justly? Do things honestly? Make decisions the same way each and every time? And God wants you and me to be on fire and doing good works and deeds for the cause of spreading the gospel. Not many of us can go on mission trips, but all of us could help spread the gospel. Spreading the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. I put something in uh, you guys' packet, and you're going to get it with your Bibles at the end of the service today. But there was four things that I wanted to challenge you to do. So, so listen to me for just a minute. You don't even have to write these down. I got it in there for you, but you can look at it. Number one, how, how do we grow in faith? So number one, we read our Bibles daily. In the restroom, Mitch just told me he's on day 13 of reading his Bible daily. Praise God. Anybody else continuing to do that daily? Please, keep it up. If you missed a day or two, that's okay. Get back in there and stay after it. And get in the habit of doing it very first thing. That's number one. Read our Bibles daily. Dig deep. Number two is pray. Make prayer an integral part of of our daily lives. Philippians chapter 4 says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what we need and thank Him for all that He has done. That's what the Scripture says. So we read, we pray. The third thing, we listen. What are we listening for? Are we listening for the still, small voice of God? In the Word, if you read back in the Old Testament, God usually spoke when it was quiet and peaceful and still. He still speaks that way. Not in an audible voice, but in a prodding, in a heartbeat racing, in a stoppage of time to get our attention. And then He directs us what to do. But we've got to be listening. You see, he never meant for prayer to be a one-way street. No, he shows us things if we will pay attention. 
Anybody ever been headed somewhere and then there was a something that slowed you up or you got in traffic or you left too late and then you get right up the road wondering why am I late and then you see an accident? Well, I could have been involved in that. Or maybe he just put someone right in your path at just the right moment that knew what you were going through. Well, you wouldn't have run into them had you not been running late or been behind or whatever situation. You see, that's God working it out well in front of us. And the last thing is worship. And you say, well, I'm, I'm worshiping right now, right? I'm not talking about this worship. I'm talking about worshiping when it's just you and God. Riding down the road, singing to the radio, or having some prayer time, or your emotions stirred to tears because of something that God's doing in your, in your life or that you need Him to do, or you've got a friend or a loved one that's hurting and you're praying, crying out to God. You see, we worship all kinds of different ways other than being right here in God's house. So we read His Word, we pray, we listen, and we worship. Lots and lots of ways to worship. In the book of Acts in chapter 2 is where we're going next. When Peter, along with the 11 disciples, stepped forward at Pentecost, his purpose was to explain the moving and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit upon God's people. And it was happening there. Let me tell you, it was happening there. And the majority of those present had never felt the presence of God's Spirit in their lives. I've told you this before, but there was always an entourage of people that were following Jesus before, and they wanted to see Him either fail, they wanted to see that He was a liar and wasn't who He said He was, or some of them really wanted to rejoice in that He was the Christ, He was the Savior of the world, and they wanted to be like Him and learn more about Him. Well, Jesus left that same desire in his disciples when he left because he left the Holy Spirit with them. It says in the word, if I be lifted up, meaning if he leaves from this earth, if I be lifted up, then I draw all men to me, to myself. Meaning Jesus couldn't stay here and each and every one of us be indwelled by the Holy Spirit. But once he left, the promise of God was the Holy Spirit would be with all of us. The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead resides in us. So when the disciples were, were trying to witness, and it was hard and tough, they kept on. And the majority of the people that they were witnessing to didn't know what they were talking about. But friend, when you accept Christ as Savior and His Holy Spirit immediately moves in, and takes up residence in your body, there should be a notable change that cannot be denied. Your children should see it. Your spouse should see it. The people you work with should see it. Even those that you consider your enemies should see it. Let's look at Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. Real quickly. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, people of New Home, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David says this about him, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. Isn't that great? Verse 28, you have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with the joy of your presence. In the essence of time, let's skip down to 36. So let everyone in Israel, everyone right here, know for certain that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. 
Listen to what it says. Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. When do we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? When you accept it. When you ask Jesus to come in. When you know that your life is not what it should be and you want it to be different. You surrender and you ask Christ to come in and the Holy Spirit comes in. Verse 39, this promise is to you, to your children, and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day, how many? 3,000. Man, I'd like to baptize 3,000. But you know what? I rejoice in just baptizing one. You know, Billy Graham had a wonderful quote about salvation, and it says this, Man stands on the brink of hell. Listen. Man stands on the brink of hell. The forces building up in our world are so overwhelming that man everywhere is beginning to cry out in desperation. What must I do to be saved? The same thing that these guys asked. What must I do to be saved? He also said, your salvation depends on what Christ has done for you, not on what you do for him. Sometimes it takes us getting to the bottom, the very bottom, to reach up for God. Your salvation depends on what God has done for you, not on what you do for Him. It isn't your hold on God that saves you, it's His, his hold on you. There's three things that each and every one of us that have ever trusted Christ as our Savior should want to do each and every day. But most times we let the world get in the way. The first one is we want to uh, connect with people through worship. And we should. The Scripture says, not forsaking the gathering together of each one of us. Even the Ten Commandments tell us to keep the Sabbath day holy. You see, it goes all the way back to the very beginning of Moses getting the original tablets. Keeping the Sabbath day holy, gathering with one another to worship, You know, years ago, they rode horse and buggy. They walked. They came on Saturday and spent the night so they could be here ahead of time for church on Sunday. They loved it. They enjoyed it. It was a great big part of their week. It was the most important part of their week. Now we have air condition and heat. We don't have to fight flies. We got nice padded cushions. We got plenty of room. We got carpet on the floors. But yet we many times find other things to take that spot. The focus is selflessly serving God and not serving God just when we can fit Him in. So number one, Connect with people through worship. Number two, we want to serve people in the name of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you the reason I say that. Many people serve. They do. They really do. But they want to make sure they get a picture and get it on Facebook. Or they want to make sure they get a nice receipt for the donation that they gave. Or have a building named in their honor. 
are you serving for that reason? Or are you really serving because of what all Christ has done for you? Serve in the name of Christ, not wanting any recognition. Become a giver for Christ. Give your time and your talents, your finances. It's all His anyway, right? The last thing we want to share, our passion and our testimony. You see, there's a newfound love for God when He comes in. And over time, it gets a little stale and stagnant. Maybe we need to do like these three done today. Rededicate ourselves. Say my, my relationship is getting close to God again. And I want people to know it. Well, the fear is, though, pulling away again. Falling prey to the world again. Being more concerned about our toys, our trinkets, and our hobbies than serving God. They can all work together. Just got to prioritize them. I heard a pastor say this one time. You, listen to me, you exist for the glory of God. You agree with that? That means every minute of every second of every day, whatever you're doing, good or bad, you and I exist for God's glory. Not ours. Most of the time when things are going good, oh, it's, it's great. How's it going? Oh, it's going wonderful. You know what I like to hear? I like to hear the person that I know things aren't going good. And I ask them, how's it going? Well, God has blessed me way beyond measure. I got these few little issues, but man, I can't complain. Isn't that the person you like to hear? You know that they're struggling with issues, they got problems, they got health concerns, they got financial issues, but they're praising God anyway. You see, that's really serving for Him and sharing your passion and your testimony. We can become a tool to lead others to know that same saving knowledge of Christ that you know. But we've got to work at it a little bit. We've got to smile a little bit even when it's hard. We got to keep on keeping on for him, even when we don't feel like it. Following Jesus, is, Jesus definitely isn't easy, but it's somewhat simple. He laid his life down for us. What will we sacrifice for him? It's not about wearing a cross on a necklace. It's not about wearing a scripture verse on your arm. It's not about wearing a t-shirt with a verse on it. It's about sacrificing for someone who loved us enough to die on a cross for us. The goal as Christians moving forward is to listen to that still small voice and do what it says and what he expects of us. I did a message back in June of 2021. I looked at it this week. It was from a, uh, a refugee pastor named Watchman Nee. And he wrote a book, Sit, Walk, Stand. Now that may sound very derogatory. Sit, walk, stand. Stand. Somewhere in there you got to stand before you walk. But you sit at the feet of Christ receiving what He's got to give. And then you walk knowing that your life has been changed in Christ serving Him. And then you stand when everyone else is against you. This young man lost his life for his proclamation for Christ. He was put to death. But not before he got this book written. Not before he reached thousands for Jesus. Sometimes we get it all wrong. We sit, 
we listen a little. Then when we begin walking, we walk pretty true until there's a problem. And then we go to what I call the gray edges, the gray areas. Because that's where Satan wants us to be, right? He wants us to participate in things that we know that are wrong, but we, we try to justify, we say, well, it's not that bad. You know, look what somebody else is doing. I'm really not that bad. And then once we do that, we don't have a leg to stand on. This morning, there was a comment by one of our baptism candidates that they wanted to proclaim what God's doing in their life now so that they, they, meaning those people that knew them when they weren't close to God, could see the change. Watchman Nee says, baptism is faith in action. Faith in action. Sit, walk, stand. Let's finish in Jude. It's only one chapter in the book of Jude. Four short verses. Verse 22. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. You know what that means? That means when we know there's problems in someone's life and we can make a difference, if we're friends or not friends, then we need to call them out and they need to call us out. They need to tell us the things that are not right. And we need to do the same for them. Rescuing others by snatching them from the flames of judgment, show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. Then it says, Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into His glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to Him who alone is God our Savior through Christ Jesus our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are His before all time and in the present and beyond all time. God has strength enough for all our troubles, our struggles, our trials, our temptations. Give them to Him today. And then finally, let me repeat what I said earlier. The tragedy of baptism is that you may have gone through all the motions, but there was no notable change that stuck, that stayed, that spilled out to others. Let's make sure that doesn't happen. Tim, I'm going to ask you to come on. Whatever song you've got for our invitation. And ask you to stand. Just close your eyes where you are for a moment. We've gone a little over our time, but that's okay. Real quickly here, search your heart. Have you asked Jesus in? Is there a point in time that you know that there was a change in your life and that He came in? Or have you been fooling yourself for lots of years thinking that you've been saved, but maybe recently you realize that you're maybe not? You see, it's the... the a decision that only you and our Savior can make. Maybe you're here today and you didn't even plan on being here this morning. But God brought you here. He's been working on you and speaking to you. And now maybe you need to walk the aisle and accept Him as Savior. Not because of any power that I have or anyone else in this church, but because of that relationship. Because we are not assured of another day on this earth. 
would you make that decision today? Or maybe you're here this morning and, and you need to rededicate your life. You need to get it right. And you don't have the power to do so. But God has that power. Or maybe you're simply here and you've been contemplating joining our church. Maybe today can be that day as well. Just search your hearts right now. Let's pray before we sing. Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the scripture. We thank you for these three that have come and blessed our hearts with the baptism today. But we thank you most of all for what Christ did on the cross at Calvary. The beatings that he took. the bloodshed, but then the resurrection from that tomb. We thank you that he did it all for us. Lord, I pray that you would work in our congregation today, that you would touch and massage hearts as only you can. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.